Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, as I told the rest of the uh, folks that were here early, extra credit there. My name is Bill Jacobs. I joined Microsoft a year and a half ago as a technical product marketing guy. I actually came in running the technical pre-sales for us for a company called Revolution Analytics. I've been in and out of the analytics space for about 12 or 13 years. We didn't even call it that. Um, growing up from big data uh, infrastructure uh, in companies like Netiza, which got bought by IBM, Greenplum, which was owned by EMC, and Sybase, which got sucked into SAP. It's been a fun space to be in. I hope you all share my enthusiasm for it. There's lots of very, very interesting cutting edge work going on right now. Um, and, and the biggest shift that I see was exemplified in the question I was asking earlier, which was how many of you are in IT, how many of you know who your data scientists are, and how many of you could name them? Um, as I said a moment ago, I asked that same question a year ago, six months ago, four months ago, and two months ago, and the numbers have slid from 10% of the IT professionals knowing who their data science teams were to about 60% now. And that's because it's becoming an important topic. What we want to do in the hour we have here is kind of overview some of the products that Microsoft can bring to the table, some of what our customers are doing with those products. I want to show you some kind of cool applications of the products, not because it's something you'd want to do, but because it's something that might set in your mind an opportunity to leverage some of the more advanced techniques in data science, particularly in machine learning, particularly in deep neural networks, particularly some of our new cognitive stuff. Um, if I can light a little fire in your imagination as you leave here and you think of some way you can help your business, uh, that, would be a, that would be a win for all of us. So with that, let me get going. Um, we'll, uh, it's, it's an hour and 15 that we have here. Um, Technology is a wonderful thing until the company that makes your smartwatch gets bought and they stop updating it and the software takes a dive. So I'm going to run on my cell phone here because <laughs> my Pebble got bought by Fitbit and that was the end of Pebble, doggone it. Um, so I have, to, I have to be careful on time. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk first about analytics as a general topic. The, the biggest thing to grapple with for a lot of people is that you may be working in an organization that understand the transformative impact of predictive analytics, or you may not. And it could be creating some discontinuity and discord in your organization. Understanding the impacts, potential impacts of advanced analytics is actually a problem you know, in the mahogany row offices more than it is in technology. I think most of us understand that being able to gather a lot of data is one thing, but we put the sharp pointy end on the arrow by doing something with that data, like predicting which pump is going to fail and take down the oil drilling rig, or which gas turbine is going to pop offline right in the middle of a cold winter night because somebody didn't recognize that we're bearings starting to make rattly noises in these you know, million dollar turbines. That's the kind of stuff that's going on in advanced analytics. Not necessarily well understood, again, in the executive offices. In other cases, it's the, it's the source of entire businesses. We'll talk about a couple of customers, and I'm gonna, leave, I'm gonna give you a little bit about what we're doing with products, show a couple of demos, and hopefully leave time for some questions. Uh, I hope that you brought a bunch of them. If you didn't, uh, you got about one hour to get those questions together, and I'll do my very best to answer as many as possible. I've, did, I've done a lot of the questioning already. I cheated and started before 3.15, so my apologies to those of you that walked in late. But this is the world we live in. We've been awash in press about big data this and big data that. This entire conference is about using the cloud. But it isn't until we apply intelligence to that data that we put that sharp pointy end on a lot of that big data. It's really great that I can retrieve all my credit card transactions for the last 25 years, probably, if I worked at it. That's one application of big data. It's ever more important if what happens is the bank can serve me better as a client and better predict what their business is going to do by aggregating all that data and building predictive models. So it is this combination of technologies, the ability to amass huge amounts of data in many formats, including some of the things I'll show you that are not human-created numbers or sensor readings, but actually images. The cloud providing a massive reduction in the cost of storage and allowing you to buy storage and compute independently that makes, that sets up the case to enable us to do huge amounts of intelligence, predictive analytics, machine learning, what is now, what we originally called 20 years ago, we're calling artificial intelligence. And I'll show you a couple of apps there. But there's a couple of things that are kind of funny. Why is predictive analytics so important? Well, some people make jokes about it, including some people far smarter than I. 
Prediction is a, very difficult, especially if it's about the future. But that's where all the money is. The insurance companies that put a dongle in your car, give it to you for a month, and say, here, drive around. Better yet, give it to your teenager who we're thinking of insuring. We want to know how your teenager's driving when you're not looking. Great example of predicting the future, whether that kid's going to crash. I have two daughters. Both are young enough to still be worrying me a lot about their driving. I'm sure a few of you have this problem. But this is the challenge that we bring together to disrupt businesses we'll see today. For most, and we talked a little bit about is Power BI a predictive analytics tool, and it really isn't, but it has a lot of analytics in it. Well, how do you compare the two? Well, we describe it this way. There are many forms of what people call analytics that would be essentially descriptive statistics. What happened? Why did it happen? Can I dig into the history and figure out the causality behind, say, a drop off in sales in a particular region of my business? But advanced analytics brings us the ability to begin predicting. And through, I, I ask how many of you had traditional um, uh, statistics products in operation in your company like SAS or SPSS. For years, those products, and many like them, have been available to allow a statistics-oriented approach to prediction. And that's kind of the gold standard today. Can we utilize regression analysis? Can we utilize clustering of customers and then regression among the clusters to understand exactly which customers are going to spend a lot of money with us and which ones are going to change their cell phone plans next week and leave us high and dry and waste our money acquiring them? That's what prediction does. But there's another quote I really like, and that's this one. Prediction's OK, right? It's building arcs that counts. And this is a man who knows how to make a lot of money. So I'll, if he says that's true, I'm going to believe him. Anybody want to argue with Warren Buffett? Not me. And so the next step in predictive analytics is actually to move to what we call prescriptive analytics, where we're taking prediction, automating the process of prediction, automating the process of measuring the results of prediction, and changing predictions again, and running a circle, a tight loop around that activity of automating and recommending and measuring. Good example. We all shop online. Anybody here not shop online? I'll probably get one or two, right? I'm not going to lie. I shop online all the time. That's the best way to get out of the car and, and have time to do other things. It's all based upon prescription because a lot of the sites that you go to, you see it at the bottom. It says, oh, other people bought this. Or up in the upper right of your search window pops a recommendation or a link to click. And that's a giant prescriptive application. It's the highest volume application on the internet in terms of transactions, higher than orders on Amazon. Because what it's doing is it's mashing millions of bids for keyword searches to occurrences of those keyword searches as, as we, the target population, use our browsers. Perfect example. And that constantly changes. The buyers of that ad space are changing those bids, in some cases, hourly. That's a giant example of a prescriptive application. So that's what we're talking about. Now the question is, what's Microsoft's perspective here? I got acquired a year ago, a year and a half ago. Uh, three years ago, I visited Microsoft. Uh, it wasn't my first time working with Microsoft to sell a company to them. Had done it in the, in the 90s. But it, when I walked in the door this last time, we made our presentation and said, you know, we have this predictive analytics stuff. It's really cool. You ought to, you ought to use it. And they got some kind of quiet looks. I'm like, OK, maybe they don't get it. And then as we were absorbed into Microsoft, we found that the company was a wash in data science projects. There's a very simple reason. Bing, Xbox, and Office. Why were those predictive analytics products? Because they're all based upon prescription to achieve better search quality, better user experience for Xbox gamers. And hell, I must tell you, I actually like Office filtering my email. It took me a while to wrestle with that get it to do what I wanted it to do, but fundamentally the ability to let the content of my prior email reading habits dictate what shows up in my end basket, that's exactly what I want. And so Microsoft finds itself at a point of having essentially five different suites of technology. There are two leaders we're going to talk about today, but I'll mention them all five here. In the middle is Cortana Analytics. The Azure Machine Learning Suite is the core component of the Cortana Analytics or Cortana Intelligence Suite. We'll talk about that today. That's, of course, as many. How many of you use Cortana or Cortana Intelligence or Cortana Analytics or Azure Machine Learning? A few of you. OK. More of you will at the end of this, I hope, or I haven't done my job. 
The second major capability was the acquisition of this company that I was working for uh, called Revolution Analytics. We specialized in an open source language called R. Gosh, real inventive name. It was patterned after S by Ross Ihaka and Robert Gentleman. So 20 years of evolution brought us to a point where there's a large community of users out there who utilize uh, R or Python and some of the other open source languages to do predictive analytics. And so Microsoft acquired the company to broaden out the range of capabilities. We'll talk about that product. But there are also capabilities hiding in the open source stacks that are in Azure. I mentioned uh, Hadoop. Any HD Insight or Hadoop users? Raise your hands again. Give me another, another shot at that question. Oh, quite a few more. Okay, most of what people are doing with Hadoop is some combination of storing massive amounts of data and running predictive analytics against that. Those are inherent characteristics, particularly in the Spark uh, DAG processing system that has evolved to dominate the Hadoop landscape. That is now an integral part of HD Insight in the Azure cloud. Very easily used, spin up as big a cluster as you need, do the work you need to do and punch delete. Gives you complete control over the cost of storage independently from the cost of compute. But the most exciting stuff, and I'm gonna show you, I love playing with it, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not much of a, an artificial intelligence guy, but the analytic APIs present an entirely new way to consume advanced analytics. Products over on the left, three, that's for people who want to learn data science and use data science, and they kind of come in two shapes and sizes. The hardcore R Python programming types who maybe learned SAS in an earlier life, and they want to write code. For each one of those, there are probably five business users, and engineering, mathematics, and business programs are minting new users hourly. At the University of Colorado, near where I live, they teach advanced analytics in the business school, not in the math school. That kind of knocked me off my feet for a minute until I thought about it. Business schools are minting a whole new crop of business professionals who want to do some elements of advanced analytics by themselves. You ever heard this recipe before? I think it was called VisiCalc, and it becomes Excel in today's world. How many how many financial professionals can sit down and bang out one hell of a detailed script in Excel? My wife's a CPA and she can outrun me in Excel hands down because she needed a tool to do to support her domain of knowledge, which was finance. Across all of the business disciplines, biostatistics, economics, actuary in the insurance business, risk analytics in financial services. We have for each real data scientist, five what we call, typically call citizen data scientists. Now, there are a lot of jokes about citizen data scientists because everybody worries, you know, should I work on my own car if I don't know how to hold a wrench? Well, in a case of desperation, most people can learn to hold a wrench and most business people can learn which portions of the analytic stack they can use if presented an easy tool. Cortana presents a lot of that. So that's the world we've come to. There's a new world coming. What about people who want to utilize the results of predictive analytics, but don't want to become data scientists. Wouldn't it be cool? We all do it. How many of you have a thumbprint sensor on your PC? There's a serious bit of machine learning inside of that thumbprint sensor. So that's an example of embedding predictive analytics in a way that it's useful to application developers or operating system developers. And that is what the analytic APIs provide to you. If you're an application developer, you don't necessarily have the time to learn about back propagation in a neural network, but wouldn't it be nice if you could just call an API that analyzed an image for you? I'm gonna show you this in a bit. It's actually easier than you think. And finally, because a lot of times, the real goal is to solve a business problem. Optimize my marketing campaigns, make my drugs better. These are things that people wanna just buy if they can, and if they can't, they resort to these other approaches. And so we're introducing a series of finished application solutions. The first three are already announced. They are predictive maintenance, elevators, jet engines, tractors. I was talking to a fellow last night. Anybody know what the Denver Stock Show is? Anybody, anybody from farm? It is the biggest cattle show in the world. But farmers and cattle ranchers come from all over the world. The guy sitting on the airplane next to me told me he has a fancy John Deere tractor. Okay, great, he probably paid a quarter of a million dollars for it. And he said if his driver puts his foot on the clutch for the more than five seconds out of any 10 seconds, 
within five minutes, he gets a call from the local John Deere dealer. Because that's hard on the tractor. That wears out the clutch. That is Internet of Things in a domain called agriculture doing predictive maintenance as a day-to-day -day feature. I was a little bit blown away by that. I grew up on a cattle farm, and I've driven a lot of tractors, and most of them had a switch that turned on the battery, and that was it. But that's how far the predictive analytics technologies and predictive maintenance are penetrating into our world. The second major solution is demand forecasting. I'm sure we all love to go buy a pair of trousers when they're on sale. That retailer hates that. They want to buy just enough of 32 width, uh, 32 waist, 32 long trousers. So I buy just as many as I need, and no more or no less are remaining after that year, that season for that retailer. Demand forecasting is about enabling retailers to be razor sharp, not about how many 32, 32 wool gabardine trousers in the world, but how many will sell in the store near this house, and how many will sell in this neighborhood, and what color will be more favored in this neighborhood? In other words, slicing and dicing down to microscopic predictions. That's our second major uh, templated solution. And uh, the third one is personalization. And I'll show you an example of some of the tools for personalization here in a bit. But that's Microsoft's portfolio. What we're doing is allowing you to innovate in this space at cloud speed. If you want to build things on-prem, our, our products will run there. If you want to hook that R stuff to the cloud or you want to work in the cloud, we have combinations across all that space that give you extensibility, the ability to grapple with data at scale, build agile processes. Now, I remember I, I asked about how many IT people are working with data scientists. That's an agility problem. It's a new agility problem. And as you, as, you as IT professionals need to be thinking, how do I work with this team that speak an entirely different language? In fact, they speak two languages. The guys that know statistics speak a different language than the guys coming from, from the machine learning world. They use different terms. So you're going to have a little bit of a language interface problem as humans when you grapple with that. But building agility around that cycle is how predictive analytics innovates quickly. And we're helping do that. And finally, the ability to do this kind of work, we are giving away some of our products in open source. Others are available uh, for the price of a credit card in Azure. We are trying to build tools that work with what you have and, moreover, what you know. Why would Microsoft adopt an open source language like R? Well, or Python for that matter. Because there are huge numbers of people that know that language. They want to keep using it. There are others that want to do drag and drop. And that's where the Azure and Cortana Intelligence Suite products fit. So we're trying to meet you where you are with products that solve the problems that you have or that your business needs you to go solve. And finally, we're trying to help you innovate within the business context with new tools built with artificial intelligence. If you don't want to become a data scientist, why don't we package it up for you and hand it to you? Thumbprint sensor, image reader, voice print reader, emotion detector. We have all of those in the product now. And sitting down with a copy of uh, you know, uh, your favorite development tool, I hope it's a Microsoft tool like Visual Studio or Xamarin, and calling those APIs anytime you have a prediction problem provides you a way to not have to become a data scientist, but be a user of data science's results. So that's what Microsoft is up to. I want to talk first about the product that I spent the last three or four years on called Microsoft R. It actually came from a company, as I said, called Revolution Analytics. Uh, but first, let's cover what is R. How many, any R users in the community here? Whoa, quite a few. I'm surprised. Uh, we got seven or eight people here who use R. What's R? Well, R is Visual Basic for stats, if you really want to get ugly about it. It is a language that a computer scientist looks at and says, oh my god. But a statistician looks at it and says, you mean I can invert a matrix with a one-line command? Yeah. And so what R provides is a, an ability for economists and biologists and population scientists people who didn't grow up writing code, to have a very easy to use language with very powerful capabilities under the covers. User community, I put it at two and a half million three years ago, but that was just by guess and by golly, kind of measuring the size of the user groups. We have no way of measuring it now. What we guess is there's probably three or 400,000 hardcore R users in the world, and probably three million people who have learned it enough to do some minor work, play with it, casual users. So it's a huge community. 
But the reason R is important is not just that it has a huge community, it's that over the last 20 years, the evolution of R as an open source language, shared by the community, owned by the community, and freely downloadable, has caused the creation of about nine, it's now, I think, squeezing 10,000 pretty hard, 10,000 freely available packages. You go to a site on the website called the Comprehensive R Archive Network, or CRAN.org, and you can find 10,000 free algorithms. In fact, it's a lot more than 10,000 because it's 10,000 packages. This slide is incorrect. Those packages contain an algorithm, 20 algorithms, a set of favorite algorithms, a data set, a test set, a way to do a problem, a document, a training course. It's all freely shared. It has one or two little problems. The R language is single machine and memory based. Ooh, wait a minute, did we say big data? So revolution made its money adapting the R language to run on big data sets by parallelizing algorithms and providing the ability to deploy and that sort of thing. And that is all now extending everything that R is. But if you look at what R is in the community, take a look at the numbers, 75% of analytic professionals, data modelers, economists, biostatisticians, these are probably unfamiliar titles to a lot of you, but these are guys who oftentimes report to the line of business and have unique new problems that they bring to the IT professionals to go, oh my, I can't even talk to this guy. So this is kind of an ongoing problem, but the growth rate is huge. We just saw in 2016, at least in the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers uh, uh, survey, IEEE, that a lot of us probably know, the R language actually displaced C sharp as the most commonly used language was a little bit weird. I think it had to do with a lot of the casual users in disciplines outside of IT, but it was a fairly interesting growth. So what Microsoft does is we take the open source R, we continue delivering it as open source, and we extend it by adding bits. And the bits we add give it scale and performance, where the R language tends to compute on a single core, on a single machine in memory, which can be fairly fast if the data fits. That's horrible if you're doing demographic data on a terabyte of data, you're gonna need a big PC. So we built a bunch of stuff that allows, it's about 80 algorithms that allow the common statistical functions like regression and clustering and uh, gradient descent boosting and that kind of thing to all be run across many, many nodes. Read a Hadoop cluster. And if you can run it across a Hadoop cluster, you can run it in SQL Server on 64 threads if you want. And so we endow R with lots of scale and performance capabilities Portability across platforms, why is this important? Well, you don't want everybody developing on Hadoop. If all your developers can do initial testing of data filtering techniques and data modeling techniques on small data sets on a laptop, that's a great way to get a lot of stuff, a lot of experimentation done, and then you take the most promising of your experiments and promote them into those big expensive assets that have the petabyte of data uh, that you're gonna use. So that's what Microsoft R is about. A um, couple of other attributes of it, we ensure that it is secure and scalable because a lot of the users are doing stuff, important stuff. You'll find our users running credit agencies and filtering out fraudulent transactions in insurance processing. Um, so there's a lot of enterprise issues with any language and open source languages tend to highlight that so we provide that support. We've got new tooling that is appropriate for people who want to learn to write in the R language. R tools for Visual Studio is open source. You can download it for Visual Studio 2015 and 16 and uh, hit a button and it'll pop up with an IDE, you'll actually see me run it here in a bit, that is designed specifically for writing and debugging the interpreted R code. Okay, and we have tools for migrating and we have business model uh, stuff that helps people build a cycle around um, as, as we have agile cycles for software development, we must have a development cycle for model development. If I build a model that predicts customer behavior, customer behavior might change over a weekend. I may want to remodel and redeploy in as little as a few hours. In the fraud chasing business, a few minutes might be the right timing. That's where they'd like to be. So that's what Microsoft R is about. It is also available, how many SQL Server users in the room? That's good. How many of you have tinkered with the R services that came in 2016? It is all the capabilities of Microsoft R embedded in the database, for free, if you get the Enterprise Edition, you get the full scale package of R, and it gives people the ability to do all the things we're talking about within the database. And I'm actually gonna show you kind of a weird concoction in a demo of doing image analysis inside the database. A Little bit of a weird place to do it, but we wanted to prove the point. So 
This is the Microsoft R product, and with that, I want to tell you about a new addition to the product. Before I go into that, um, there's a problem. Everybody wants to know where galaxies come from. I sit and think about this all the time. I'm sure you do, too. Um, the first thing that, that uh, astrophysicists want to do, because there's a couple of more stars in the sky than they want to bother counting manually, right? Like a couple of billion. And they want to grab photographic images of galaxies. And because the origin of a galaxy is, is more easily determined if you know the shape of the galaxy, they want to determine the shape very quickly. And there are a couple of categorizations. Spherical, round, uh, spiral, and spiral with a bar. And these are the three characterizations they do. But some of these things are buried down tightly in very fine-grained photography. So what they'd like to be able to do is automate a sweep of the sky and pick out all the images and run a machine learning algorithm that knows how to say what type of galaxy is each one of the little images they have. You can do it manually, but with a few billion of them in the sky, it's not something anybody wants to take on. So he said, OK, can we solve this problem with machine learning? Well, in version 9 of the Microsoft R server products, we had a kind of a watershed event. Anytime you get acquired by a big company, you run the risk of peeling your company apart into lots of little pieces and losing your product identity. And we fought hard not to let that happen. But a good thing happened in this version 9 that we released in December. We saw our first onboarding of a series of technologies that we would never have been able to invent under our own nickel as revolution. The Microsoft Research Labs in Boston are building advanced machine learning techniques for the corporation, and they are building packages that now snap into the Microsoft R products. The six new algorithms they put out, five were fast learners, fast regression, fast clusters, fast trees, fast random forest that parallelize naturally and, 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 and do really wonderful things for marketers. But the sixth algorithm they put in is very cool. It is a deep neural networks package for building your own neural network and training it. And I want to show you how we use that to solve this problem. So what happens in galaxy class classification is we want to construct a neural network using this package called Microsoft ML. And it's uh, a component of, of, of Microsoft R. We've, we needed to feed it about 700,000 images that have already been classified. Now, that's actually about 250,000 images. But we then rotate the images a little bit to kind of give the machine learning algorithm a chance to see the orientations differently. So if I look at the scars from the southern hemisphere, my photographs can still be characterized. And we ran that through uh, this deep neural network tool uh, with a, a description of a six node, I think it's a back propagating neural network. I am not a neural networks guy. It's, uh, I'm learning the words. Um, it's kind of like you know, humming along with the music. I can't really play the music, but it sure sounds good to me. Um, but that deep neural network is actually built using the new features of Microsoft R, and it's actually deployed in the SQL Server database. It could also be deployed in HD inside in the cloud. Now, what we found was, gee, that's a hard math problem. Why don't we also endow that deep neural network uh, toolkit with the ability to use GPUs if they're present? And we got a nice, slick 10x performance boost. Training 700,000 images in Azure on a big machine, took us about 30-some uh, hours, and it ran about 10 times faster when we got a hold of one of those new slick uh, virtual machines with uh, a, a GPU in the back plane. So that's what I'm going to show you. Hopefully, it won't take very long. We'll uh, skip back to this picture, and uh, I'll open up and show you this demonstration. So let me stop PowerPoint for a moment. And we are going to go to a remote machine that's sitting out in uh, cloud space. Um, hold on a second. Let me uh, figure out where I had that. It wasn't with Putty. And that's not the one. I want the RDP. There we go. No, that's Putty again. I had it opened. I, I, I promise I had it open. And I shut down my machine. So let's find my crib sheet and open the Galaxy classification. And open it up. So I'm opening this VM, and what's running there is SQL Server, Windows Server, and some stuff we built. So let me show you the stuff we built. So to solve this problem, we initially loaded a quarter of a million images into the file system, indexed the, the uh, file path to the files, a little bit of data about the files, and put that all in SQL Server. 
And that gave us a way to register and to navigate through the images with the algorithm. But here's what actually goes on. And um, what I want to show you here, I'm going to show you the result, and then I'm going to show you how it's built. So let me try and get this all on the screen. This is a little web app we built. And basically, all it does is it allows you to navigate to a set of new images about which we know very little and run the machine learning algorithm, or the, the actual the predictor, the model that the machine learning algorithm created over those images so it categorizes them for us. So with that in mind, I've got a couple of batches out there. So I'll run this. And what it's doing is kicking off. Uh, there's about 20 images here, I think. And there are 20 images that we had in the files categorized by elliptical in two categories, by spiral, spiral barred, standard spiral, and a couple of other characterizations. So that was, and what you saw in that time was, we loaded these 20 or so images into the database. Not the images, we loaded the, the file URLs. And then the uh, trigger fired each time a, a row was inserted. It ran a scoring algorithm that picked up the image and said, based on what I know about images of galaxies, that's A, and categorize each of those. Okay, so it, it happens fairly quickly. Scoring turns out to be the easiest part of the task. I've got another batch here. Watch this again. This is another 15 or 20, and that's how fast it ran. This is not on a raging fast machine. It does have a GPU. It's a, I think it's a two-core machine or a two-socket machine with uh, 16 or 32 cores total. So that's what it actually does. Now, the point here is not looking at stars. The point here is any amount of imagery that you might have that expresses something you want to be able to analyze. Find faces is something we do automatically. But maybe you or anybody here work for a chip company, chip manufacturers? Oh, they want to look at lots and lots and lots of pictures, right? Eight-inch wafers with 10,000 chips. Where are the chips bad? Where have I got a problem in the wafer? Can I use optical comparator technology in humans? Oh, that's too expensive. Can I use machine learning to generate a model that can spot bad chips on the wafer long before it gets to the end of the production line and I pay the money to slice it up and put it in a package and, and stick it in a tester? Million dollars a day when they have a failure. So this is the kind of thing that this is designed to do. Now, for fun, let's have a quick look at what it took to build that. So this is actually the database that we're running in. Can you guys read this? Everybody read this OK? I don't know if I can get it much bigger. Um, and what's in the database is this. Let's first look at the tables. There's a table in the database that contains the galaxy images that we care about, the ones we're going to train on. And they look like this, as you might guess. As I said, we're just storing the, uh, the file path and an identifier. So that's really about all we pick up. Now, these have already been categorized. As you can see, I have my classes, SE, SB, SE. These are all spirals. There's an elliptical hiding down in here somewhere. And this is what, this is a training set. This is what experts have done. They've looked at, it, looked at the picture and said, that's a spiral bar, boom, coded in the database. And that gives us what we call a supervised learning set. We can take a sample of that and say, that's our training set. Take another sample. That's our testing set. Build a model on the training set. Validate that the model really does predict on a whole other set of images called a testing set. And if the model works, that's the one we use. And that's what we did. So the question is, how hard was it to build that? Well, let me show you what's in the R code now. And then I'll show you how it gets deployed so we can just make it executable in the database. Now, I've pulled the R code out. We would typically develop it in, um, in this IDE. This is actually Visual Studio. And it's Visual Studio with the R tools for Visual Studio component added in. And what you see in the code here is R code, obviously. Um, and we're setting up the environment. And this is the first thing I want you to note, is that one of the hyperparameters I can feed the algorithm is that, yep, we do have a GPU in this in this uh, underlying CPU, so please run with the GPU acceleration turned on. If I run on a machine that doesn't have the GPU, I have to comment out that line and, of course, wait nine times longer uh, for it to run. I set up my parameters, but here's the good part. Let me show you. Uh, I'm just scrolling through this R code, and it's, it's a little sluggish because it's up on the, on the web, and the network here is not too strong. But this is the definition of the neural network, and you'd expect this to take a lot more code. But I'm going to highlight this and show you this is, I think it's about 60 lines of code. That's it right there. That's all there is to it. And that defines, 
I think this one is an input node, five hidden nodes, and an output node. Now, for someone who knows AI and knows how to build neural networks, that's a very straightforward expression of something they do graphically all day long, and there's 20 or 30 dominant topologies of neural networks that mimic how the human brain looks at stuff. So this is a six-node network, reasonably complicated, but it only took about 60 lines of code to build. Once I built the network, I stuff it in a, a, a data frame, as it's called, it's a data structure in R, called net definition. Later, when it comes time to run it, I want to create a model. In other words, I want to build a predictive equation. It's what we call models in data science. And I want to stuff in there the math that I determine by running that neural network over 700,000 images. And that occurs here. I run something called uh, Rx Neural Net, which is remote executing neural net. That's the interface name to the stuff we built in our toolkit that's accessible to the R programmer. It takes that model definition, the, the, the neural network definition that I built in that 60 lines of code, and runs that model, feeds it 700,000 images, and lets that model think about those images. And it actually goes through them 25 times, I think, in this setting, if I read the code right. But so there's, you know, you have less than 100 lines of code. Now, the person who wrote this knows about neural networks, but the person who wrote this didn't have to write the neural network. They only had to describe it in the 60 lines of code I showed you. Once they finished with that, they created a model by training that model. And by the way, there's another step which we don't show, which is to take the model and run it against another few hundred thousand images that we haven't seen before and see whether it really is predicting correctly. So that's a very standard procedure in data science is to separate out a training set and a testing set. Train, 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 train to get something you think is good. Run it on your test set, run it on your bigger test set, and then launch it to production. So how do we do that in SQL Server now? Well, SQL Server, we endowed with the ability to embed R. And let me show you how that is done. I'll go back to um, the Explorer here. I'll go back over to the database tools. Now, to see what's happening in the database, you can imagine I have one table that's got all my data in it, which is all the file pointers to the 700,000 images. And then the second thing I need to do is create a stored procedure that contains that model I built. Very simple. I can actually embed with SQL Server 2016, I can embed the R code I need right inside a SQL Server in the SQL language so that I can run it as part of a stored procedure. So let's take a look at that. The stored procedure is under programmability here, and it is called train galaxies. Let's take a look at that code. Well, heck, look at this. It's got some SQL on it. Son of a gun. I'm setting a string variable here called CMD to that same code you saw a minute ago. I just take my uh, 100 lines or so of R that I showed you, and I paste it directly in line into the SQL code here I'm using it as a string. I can also inline it directly. But when it comes time to run it, I can tell SQL to execute an external, store, execute, uh, a, a, an external script. And this is a framework that we built in SQL Server. Right now, it only does R. But you can bet what our next step is. Who, who would guess what our next language is to go in this framework? Oh, that's a terrible guess. Try again. He's dead right. <laughs> OK, so the obvious opportunity here is to help SQL DBAs and SQL writers, people who understand the SQL language, work together to bring together these two so disparate fields. Now, remember I said you've got two different languages spoken between the humans? Well, here we're at least able to merge the technical languages. It's up to you to deal with the human language problem. Um, so once I have created this ability to run my training model, I want to store that model now after I've created it, and I keep a table in the database called Galaxy Models, so I can actually keep multiple iterations of my predictive model, my, my, my little equation that I point at each image and say that's an elliptical or a spiral with a bar. That equation gets stored in a little blob in a little table, okay? So I essentially do my deployment of an algorithm by putting it in a stored procedure, and then that stored procedure dumps the actual equation, equation into that table so I can retrieve it later. So how do I use it once I've created it? Ah, how about I put it in a trigger? So what I do when I, once I have the uh, table here that contains those, 
that model, the one I care about, or any of the others, I can then use that in my database in a table called Galaxies to Score. And I have triggers. Well, there it is. And I'll look now at that. That uh, trigger called T insert galleries to score basically retrieves and executes the prediction as a part of a table trigger. So each time we insert a new image into the table, it's, you know, file path identifier. It tells R, go run the predictor and append those values into the column for what type of galaxy is this. So all my web app has to do is send the stored procedure a list of the 20 files it wants, or it has to simply insert the files. And then the database will take care of firing that predictor on each new row in the database. The scoring model that I built will then analyze that image, pull back the prediction, stuff it in the table next to the prediction. And then the application simply says, retrieve all the new stuff I just stuck in the table. And that's what you saw the display the graphic doing. So this is an example of simplifying the path for enabling SQL professionals, app development professionals, BI tool users who all know databases in SQL to work with data scientists who know R, and in this particular example, data scientists who know R and are learning how to use neural networks. So that's kind of the leading edge of what we're doing in the R product. I'd like to skip ahead now a little bit, do a quick time check here, uh, to talk about the Cortana product, and I have another demo I'd like to show you there. So let's see, we got to here, here. Let's talk a little bit about Cortana intelligence. How many of you, again, uh, raise your hands again for me. How many of you are using Cortana? And how many of you are going to go start after this? Thank you. Thank you. I've done my job. I feel better now. So Cortana is the creation of a, a number of people working in Azure. It's cloud-based. It provides the ability to jumpstart analytics by making the development of the flows. In R, you have to write code that says, do this, do this, do this, do this. It's a, definitely a, you know, a third generation language oriented approach. Cortana takes a drag and drop approach through the Azure Machine Learning Studio that makes it very easy to build things, but also to share design patterns. And if you go into the Cortana gallery, there are a huge number of these pre-built solutions or examples that our data science team have built to show our users how to most quickly get going, get something built, and start experimenting. A lot of this is available uh, directly for, uh, for you in the login. Once you find a pattern that works, deploying things is trivially simple. The standard method in Cortana is to build something that does the prediction you want and create a web service API that's accessible inside of Azure or on-prem outside in, the, in the, uh, uh, the world that we know today. Machine learning gives you the ability to do all kinds of powerful things. This particular graphic is anomaly detection. A lot of forms of anomaly detection, the credit card companies that, I don't know how many credit cards you have in your pocket, I carry about three, and I can point to millions of dollars that get spent on predictive analytics technology every week by the likes of Chase and, and uh, Wells Fargo and American Express, uh, because they're in this cat and mouse game. They get smarter, the thieves get smarter, they get smarter, the thieves get smarter. It's a huge opportunity. This is an example of that. The same anomaly detection problems exist in uh, machine failure prediction and lots of other attributes. But the goal here is to enable people to start quickly, do this without a full-on data scientist in the room. You do not have to go off and get a PhD in stats to learn to do very good work in Cortana. A lot of what we can offer in Cortana is access to a lot of our ecosystem because Cortana is, is, is a collection of everything you need to ingest data, to persist data, to handle inbound data coming in as batches. Maybe you're sucking it out of a copy of SQL Server on-prem or to capture things that are coming in in a stream. Your teenager's cornering too fast and the dongle is firing messages saying, guess what, Pop, your kid's going to wreck. So all of those facilities are part of the Cortana Intelligence Suite. We have a lot of users. These are just a subset of those customers that have allowed us to use their logo to describe uh, some of the things that they're doing uh, in, uh, in Cortana. So let's dig into a couple. Quarter Spot is a, a kind of an interesting case. Um, they provide lending 
and, and uh, uh, lending rating kind of software. So they provide a lender the ability to learn more and use machine learning techniques to better rate the credit worthiness of their prospective users. And they're a, they're a service provider, so they deliver this, this value through the banks. Schneider Electric is another. They're doing more of an Internet of Things, a sensor-based analytics. There's a number of places it appears in their product line, uh, but they're using it across product lines, so it's an innovation tool they use in multiple business units. Um, and uh, they're doing a lot of things largely targeted to maintaining the uptime of the power grid. None of us like to see the power drop below 110 volts or so, because when it drops down there, things in our houses start behaving badly, like our washing machines don't work as well. Um, the, the greater risks, uh, some of the things they're attacking are overload, but also uh, terrorist threat to the, uh, to the power grid as well. So very interesting stuff going on, all done in Azure. Now, I have some background in this space. I am actually a commercial pilot, so I follow this one closely. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of opportunity in the aerospace business for one reason and one reason only. Yeah, we all, none of us want to crash. That's certainly a reason. But if you're operating an airline, you don't want that airplane to sit idle for more than the time it takes to hurry everyone off and hurry the next crowd on and swap the pilots if you need to. And so what companies like Rolls-Royce are able to do is provide a much higher degree of prediction to the airline operators and to change how they sell engines. I don't know if you know this. I mean, Rolls-Royce and GE and Williams and those guys, yeah, they'll sell you a jet engine. But most of the jet engines out there are actually owned by Rolls-Royce, even though they're hanging on the wing of somebody's Airbus, because they have tooled out this process of predicting failure so closely that they can actually sell hours of operation. We have two clients doing elevators. And they don't sell elevators. They sell uptime. They sell rides. They own the elevator. So it's actually a disruption to those entire industries because it's so ch it, it gives the owners of the business, the deliverers of those products, such predictive ability that they can actually change their pricing models to sell what the customer is actually buying. None of, us buys a ride, none of us buys a jet engine. We buy transportation from point A to point B, and I buy more of it than I wish I had to. Um, but uh, you know, uh, one of the stats I heard a while back, and this was five years ago or so when I was working at Pivotal, uh, General Electric and their jets um, generate 10 terabytes of data in one transatlantic crossing. So there's massive amounts of data coming off these engines and sensor readings. There is vibration information. If there's a bearing that gets a little worn, it starts rumbling, and they can pick it up with a, uh, an acoustic sensor and analyze that waveform. This is a huge amount of information. If they can track the service life of that engine, how many cycles? How many times did it fly through an abrasive cloud because a volcano popped off over in the Pacific Rim? These are all the kinds of things that allow Rolls-Royce and all the other manufacturers to very accurately predict when these engines need service. So I have a video here. It's um, actually about that Rolls-Royce case. So let me roll that real quick. I hope the audio is still working. As an airline pilot, I know that to fly with the best, you need to work with the best. With over 13,000 engines in operation around the globe, Rolls-Royce provides the services to maintain them at peak performance. Today, each engine has thousands of sensors that can produce terabytes of data on long-haul flights. Making sense of all that data is critical in transporting my passengers safely and efficiently. Rolls-Royce uses Azure IoT Suite to analyze data remotely and deliver real-time, actionable insights to me and to the airlines about engine performance and operational efficiencies. Advanced analytics help us optimize fuel economy, anticipate maintenance needs, and avoid costly downtime and delays. A single unscheduled disruption and its knock-on effect to a fleet and the passengers can cost an airline up to a million dollars a day. With early notice, our team can proactively have parts at the right place and time, reducing inventory costs and maximizing availability. Up to one-third of a plane's weight is fuel. As a pilot, I decide how much fuel my plane carries. Insights into engine efficiency, weather conditions, flight path, and scheduled landings impact my decision. Cortana Intelligence helps me choose the optimal fuel level to maximize efficiency. With 40% of our operating budget devoted to fuel, even a small percentage reduction can save us tens of millions of dollars each year. 
Microsoft and Rolls-Royce, reaching new heights in customer value. Okay, the only thing I'll leave you with is we'll have no wisecracks about the blue screen of death. Um, fortunately, they're required to carry two of those surfaces on every airplane. Um, I had mine crash one time in flight and I needed it, so. But this is a fascinating area. It is one of the reasons why the Internet of Things is so important to all of us. Yeah, it's cool to think about our refrigerator telling us when we need a pound of butter, but the applications that are driving that business right now are what we call the industrial Internet of Things. The consumer side is going to be with us for a long time. Eventually, we all drive self-driving cars. But today, everything we physically touch and the, everything we buy, particularly the high price stuff, is coming with sensors in it. I mentioned the manufacturer of wafers. Today, when a large semicon in, say, Taiwan is making wafers, they're making 8-inch wafers, up to 10,000 chips on a wafer, and 50 or 100 of those wafers come down in a tray. And the machine operates on all of the ones in a tray and sends it on to the next step. If they get a machine going out of spec, it'll kill all those wafers. Well, that could be 100,000 chips. How much data is that going to generate? Because now they're at the point where each one of the chips is generating data that can be probed individually and measured. And they'll sample out all across the wafer, is this one in spec, is this one in spec, is this one in spec, to make sure that they're getting uniform manufacturing across those. They'll carry that sensor technology all the way out into the final application. We just did a joint venture with Toyota to switch to cars. A joint venture puts smarts in the car, which is already kind of there, but it puts reporting of that smarts back to the manufacturer in play as a way to improve products. Toyota advertised it in May when we did the deal as this car knows where you want to go for your favorite kind of food. And it's, I think, a burrito example. But as a product guy, and I used to work in the auto business a little bit, what those guys are really after is they will get back how many days a week it drove, how far it drove, how many of the seats were occupied, and they may even at some point know how many cup holders had a cup in them. How useful would that be if you're trying to design a car that rifle shots the requirements of a narrow set of people? Well, this is what Internet of Things does for us. Certainly, it allows things to run better and longer, but it gives product planners a chance to much more closely tailor products to what we want to buy. Oops, that isn't going to work. Let me get back. So let's talk a little bit about Cortana, and then I want to show you some of the futures that we're working on. Uh, and I've got one other demo to show you. So, Cortana really is designed to handle the end-to-end -end problem of managing the ingest and governance of data, the securing of that data, the analysis of that data, and then the interaction with that data. If we look at the pieces in the suite, we've been talking about advanced analytics, and that is only one of the chiclets on the slide here. And there's three or four different flavors of analytics that are available in Cortana. Certainly the Azure Machine Learning Suite, the R products, all of the analytic capabilities that are present in HD Insight and other Hadoop-oriented clusters like Spark are available, and they live in this framework that also has all the integration capabilities that we think you would need to expose that data in a, as a dashboard, as an automated action in a customer-facing website. So let's talk about what we're doing. Going forward, we have a couple of things in mind. For the R products, we're continuing to integrate those into Microsoft. They're becoming part of all the Microsoft uh, platforms that have analytic capabilities. R is available in HD Insight. R is available in SQL Server. R is available in, H in, uh, in the Azure Machine Learning Studio and in Cortana. So we are bringing R to the places where you're building applications. The second thing we're continuing to work on is this problem of how do you take an open source product that has a very good history, but it's still not something that most governance bodies will trust in a production context. How do you make sure that it is trustable? How many of you have restrictions on where you can deploy open source? See a few hands going up. If you go into the financial services, for example, how many, anybody in FSI? Bankers, brokers, most of those t uh, firms that we deal with have restrictions on where they can deploy open source. And so we provide support capabilities that en enable those users to have some assurance that there's someone on the other end of that telephone at 3 in the morning when some system that's uh, critical goes down. We're doing a lot of work in bringing artificial intelligence to the R-based products. I showed you that Galaxy demo. That's based upon the very first effort in that long stream of technology that will be coming out from our research labs. And finally, we think that Getting you to results more quickly with stuff that's pre-built probably is the best way to help you and your boss uh, make your boat payments over time. 
And so we'll continue to invest in these pre-built solutions, both built in Cortana and built in the R products. With Cortana, this is another depiction of all the pieces. There are lots of different pl places on this chart where there are new features coming to fore. The ones that we're working on, again, working with what you have. We are working very hard to improve the tooling facilities that are used to develop and the integration facilities for deploying. We are bringing forth a lot of stuff to help you. I think this has got a pointer, but I can't get it to work. To um, provide new ways to interact with the system. And I'm going to show you a demonstration of a chat bot. What, everybody know what a chat bot is? You've probably seen them on some. Well, we're building smarter and smarter and smarter chat bots. And you'll see in there that we believe there is a new form of interaction coming. And I want to talk about that in detail called conversation as a platform. Rather than building web pages where the user has to read and look and poke, why not yell at the user, say, I want to buy something in text or in voice, and have the system either decode the voice or read the text, linguistically analyze it regardless of language, and respond appropriately. And finally, we're doing uh, a number of solutions in the Cortana product as well. Uh, I mentioned the three that we've announced. There will be a lot more coming in that arena. We're doing a lot of work here. This was probably, how many of you heard, heard the old sage uh, when you're building a warehouse? Pardon my hand, I, the bright lights, I can't see your faces. But remember the old, the old saw, 80% of the work is in getting the data? Everybody, everybody's heard that? Anybody not heard that? Well, guess what? History has a bad habit of repeating itself. Big data makes the data ingest problem even bigger, and we still hear today in these big data systems doing Internet of Things ingest of events or doing market planning ingest of demographics and credit data. People still report that 80% of the problem is not building the data science. It's getting the data loaded, understood, and shaped up. It needs to be typically in rectangular uh, you know, in data tables, so that it can be used for data science. And so we're doing a lot, of, uh, a lot of work in the process, building new tools to allow at very high speed and very, easy, very high ease of use, the ingest at formatting, joining, and normalization and cleansing of data to accelerate the data science process. We're working a lot in language work. Azure Machine Learning is providing us with a number of capabilities. Um, we're also adding capabilities to the R language and to the uh, uh, Azure, uh, the ADF products, along with R and Python. So one of the things that's changed just recently is the Azure Data Lake has been essentially in preview, and the Data Lake store is now going GA. It has no limits on scale, as many of you may know, and is now a generally available capability in Azure with full support. Another major area is the data lake analytics. Now, these are the capabilities that come with Hadoop. And so because they are living in Hadoop and we're extending them with things like a, uh, a new version of SQL called USQL, which has the capability of embedding C++ and other languages, we're giving much greater capability to you to do analytics in very, very large data assets in the cloud. We're adding, of course, federated query across sources, because oftentimes you'll want to join data across dissimilar sources, and access control that you'll need, because a lot of the data that people are finding most attractive for big learning projects also happens to have, you guessed it, personal data in there. HIPAA problems, PCI problems, and the like. So a couple of those have gone, um, uh, gone GA as part of our uh, engineering efforts. Now, inside of the Cortana Intelligence Suite and sitting alongside the Azure Machine Learning Studio are all these cognitive services. How many of you have worked with any of the cognitive services? A couple of you. What did you work with? Yeah, which ones did you use? Cool. Did you get as far as looking at the emotion detection parts of that? Yeah, so there's a, I'm not going to show it here, but we have a demo you can find. You probably look it up on web with, uh, with Bing. And it, you just feed it a photograph. Or you feed it a live video feed. And it'll pick out the four or five faces that are, that are within six or eight feet of a camera. And it will use machine learning to look at the facial expression and take a wild guess as to the mood. And it is shockingly accurate. We all remember the one that guessed ages, right? I hate that one because it always tagged five years on me that I haven't experienced. But the facial recognition one, it always said I was 65. It made me very angry. Um, but the facial recognition one not only picks faces out and gives you a, an XML document that says, here's where the face is in the picture, it'll also tell you what's the expression on that face. Very, very cool. Think about customer service. Think about 
security. There's just huge numbers of applications. Um, in that set are a whole range of human capabilities, human-like capabilities that we're attempting to bring to the fore. Some of these may require you to be a data scientist. You that were using it in the back, I want to ask you a question. Are you a data scientist or are you just using this stuff? Developer. You're a developer. Okay, so he's the new role. He doesn't, he's not being a data scientist. He's embedding data science that we deliver. So that's the new consumption model that we think is most interesting, especially for these technologies that give us the ability to deal with humans. So one of the things we've been working real hard on, I'm actually going to show you this, it's called a bot framework. Now, we've all dealt with bots and these conversational things on the web that have a very, very, very limited vocabulary. Anybody ever used one of those and got really frustrated and just closed that window and said, please get me a human? Well, that's always going to be there, but we are pushing the boundary of how much the bot can do by improving the smarts of the bot, the language tolerance of the bot, and the ability of bots to extract an idea from what you type, not the literal translation. So let me show you a couple of examples. This is, a, this is actually a half, it's a half-baked demo. It's a, it's a preview, and so as a, sometime I'll tell you all the joke about a buddy of mine who actually cut a rubber chicken in half to sacrifice it to the software gods and sent it across the, the crowd. It, it was quite an event. Um, but what we're doing Let's say th this, is, this is a scenario we set in a fictitious insurance company called Litware. Now, I don't know where Litware comes from, but I noticed that I and most of my colleagues live in a state where marijuana has been normalized. I don't know. Maybe something about being lit. Um, I, bad joke. But let's say that Litware wanted to personalize the experience a little bit and utilize this conversation as a platform <clears throat> rather than forcing their users to pick through a bunch of buttons and navigate through a website. Do you remember when Net, you, you, know, you first got your first uh, insurance company website? You think, wow, this is really cool. I can see all my policies. Well, we're now to the point where, don't make me go feed, we'll, you know, pushing through all that just to, f to get new insurance. I really want to talk to a human, but you don't want to pay for a human, so let's let a bot do the work. Well, that's what's going on here. What's happening in this is we have a bot. We built it using our bot framework, and it has a few semi-capabilities here. It's not wildly tooled out. If I go off the trail, it'll go back to the beginning on me because we haven't, it's just a prototype at this point. But if I say hi, it comes back and says hi, hi back to me. If I say hola, and I do speak a little Spanish, it comes back and says, ah, oh, hola, soy un bot. Puede ayudar con seguir su seguros 24 by 7. How did it figure that out? It's not looking at the words I'm typing in. It's looking at the meaning of the words I'm typing in and the origin of those words. Bonjour. It comes back, and I can't pronounce this because anybody speak French? Read this out. I, I, I don't speak French. I can butcher it, but uh, the idea here is that it can switch between languages based upon what it sees coming in in language and in meaning. I want to buy insurance comes back, and I can type that 20 different ways. I said, what kind do you want? I can type in automotive or car, and it's going to come back and give me what I want. So let's say auto insurance. It knows that auto, car, and automotive are the same things. So it says, do you want to do a policy? I can help you with that. Are you an existing customer? Yes, I am. And, I, and oh, what's the name I'm supposed to use here? This is where doing demos that are early prototypes is kind of tough because I forget things like logins and the names of the individual. Well, let's hope I get through this without failing on this, because I have to have a particular name to get some stuff out of the CRM system. Olson, I uh, R Olson, is that right? And the last four digits. It's going to come back. That's not the right name. <laughs> See, it's a smart bot. It knows that it only has limited functionality. So if you will bear with me for just a moment, I will try and figure out where I stuffed that document that told me where to find the name I need to type in. This is a really bad demo. I'm sorry to do that. What's that? Alice. 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 Oh. How many of you guys have seen this? Why am I doing this? Thank you. It's Alice Olson. So Alice Olson is an existing customer, so we'll, yeah, okay, fine. Want to buy insurance. And I want to buy auto insurance. And yes, 
My name is indeed Alice Olson. I'm an existing customer. And my name is Alice Olson. Thank you from the peanut gallery there for, for uh, knowing this demo better than I do. That's kind of scary. So I give it the information that the bot needs, and the bot comes back, and it wants to, it wants to get a little more information. Um, but what I want to show you out of this is, again, this is just a prototype. It is not well built, just little bits of this demo. But what I want to show you is the first thing is personalization. This is one of the fastest growing a uh, aspects of predictive analytics right now. There are brick and mortar stores that are really taking the Macy's and the Sears of the world to the woodshed. And they're doing it with techniques like personalization. And one of those is in clothing purchase, one of the biggest inventory items is the floor space that it takes to put all the different sizes of my trousers on the rack. Well, I'm a pretty flexible shopper. I don't think my wife or my daughters would ever go for this. But if I could walk in the store and say, I need dark trousers, 32, 32, and the computer showed me a picture of how they look with my suit, and I could say, fine, have them to my house in an hour or a day, I'd be thrilled with that. Look at the size of the store I need to do that. It's a phone booth compared to these massive stores that are maintained in brick and mortar retail. Think of the personalization possibilities. Think of the bot here in our insurance context. Or if you're a, a broker operating a brokerage for new clients who may be young and not familiar with the terms of managing your own uh, resources, Think about being able to adapt to a new investor or a very senior investor uh, right from the very beginning of the relationship and tailor that experience. That's exactly what most large companies are trying to do. So what the system see here is seeing that in my customer record, I have a daughter who's just turned 16. Technically, I actually have two. One's 18 and one's 20. They're past the stage where I'm worrying about putting them on my insurance. But this person is probably worried about that. And certainly, the insurance company is worried about it, because we know that teenagers have a pretty rotten driving record. I sure as heck did. So I'll go ahead and fess up that I do want to put this child on my policy. It'll automatically enter the yes answer. And I want to tell it I want a Ford. I'm going to buy a Ford, and I'm going to buy an Escape. And it's going to ask, oh, well, what year did uh, that, that model uh, come out? What year is that? Well, let's say it's a 2016. It'll give me the choices that I need to put in. I'll change it. It'll get mad at me. But let's say, OK, we have a photo of the car. Oh, oh I skipped too far ahead. <laughs> I was just getting to the fun part here. I just clicked to, twice on something. Um, the next thing that we want this bot to be able to do is to uh, provide kind of the sex, second function of a bot. The first function of a bot is to personalize the experience. The second function of a bot, the second pillar behind bots, is the ability for the bot to actually help augment the human staff. Think of the examples of this. Most of you, how many, anybody here uh, know or related to an anesthesiologist or a surgeon? There are lots of efforts underway, particularly among radiologists, because radiologists are imperfect. They miss things. So if we use automated machine learning and intelligence to augment a radiologist, what might we likely do? Hey, dude, you missed that little tumor down in the lower right, that very fine little wispy thing that appears in that lung x-ray. So there's lots and lots of examples of utilizing the bot to help what the humans are doing. One of them is to help the customer. The second one is to help the employee. So in this case, what we're going to do is, uh, oh, we're going to get you set up. I think I've broken the demo. So I'm going to stop. Oh, no, it is giving, it is not broken. It was computing the rates. And I'm going to say, you know, that's pretty expensive. Good example of what happens there when the customer says, pretty expensive, and it says, I'm a bot. We know I've completely broken the demo. But what it's supposed to do, this is where we do the hand waving over the, the projector thing. Uh, it's supposed to then say, I will get a human on the phone with you. This enables a third form of advancement from conversation as a platform. And that is, if all we get to learn is where somebody clicks in response to what's on a page, that's some information. If we can analyze the words they're using, and heaven forbid a picture of them while they're doing it with an emotion detector on there, how much more information are we going to have to make marketing decisions? Oodles and oodles and oodles of more information. 
And so what we can do is not only have them come back and say, no, it's too expensive. We can bring a human on the line, or we can analyze the words that they said. Why do you think it's too expensive? Well, there's this other company. And begin doing sentiment analysis at a very detailed level when we have large populations of these kind of events. So I'm going to skip with the bot. We're getting kind of short on time, but I'll tell you just jokingly what we do here is it asks for a picture of the car. And of course, the big joke is to send it pictures of other things, so fighter jets, horses and buggies. And the thing I don't get to show you because I don't want to take five more minutes is the image ana analyzer is hooked to this, and it actually reads the image and says, oh, that looks like a horse and buggy. Are you sure that's the right image? And I was trying it this afternoon. I fed it 10 or 12 images. I fed it a, uh, an F F-35 fighter, and it says, that looks like an airplane flying against the blue sky. And so when we start combining technologies like the bot framework and the language smarts it brings with the visual smarts that all these image analysis, facial analysis, emotion detection uh, kinds of algorithms, and putting those together, we move so far beyond what we do today with a telephone and a web browser that we are actually taking the, the platform way forward to this new model of conversation as a platform, and it's really not just conversation. So with that, if anybody wants to see what it does on the, on the vehicles, I'll be happy to show it later. Um, some of the other examples that we want to show you are, this is an example, I think this one's actually built. This is a vacation reporting bot. Anybody got the problem of not knowing where to report your vacation in your company's website? It takes me 10 minutes to find it every time at Microsoft. I'll be thrilled when this is launched inside the company because I'll just say, hey, boss, I'm going on vacation. They'll say, when are you going? And we'll be done. It'll shorten that conversation for me and probably for my boss because I'll do it on a more timely basis for him by a factor of three or four. Another one is uh, this is an internal bot. I don't yet use this, but it, they're building this and it's, it's being prototyped around our directory. Well, Microsoft's got a few employees and finding people is really tough. So the ability to just ask the bot questions and ask the bot who does he work for, who else is on the team. Believe it or not, Microsoft folks do go on vacation. And when they do, the hardest problem sometimes is finding someone who can help you with a project when the person you needed to talk to is out you know, paddling in the Gulf of Alaska. So um, we just did that demo. Um, as we look out, we're going to continue to build Advanced analytics products tackle a bunch of industries, and we think that by tackling these industries, we'll get pretty good coverage of the other industries that aren't on the slide. I hope that you find that to be true. Some of the very interesting stuff we're doing is cross-technology. Uh, the ability to use Cortana alongside the HoloLens virtual reality platform um, gives us the ability to do some things like this. Now, this is actually being done for a little bitty hardware store called Lowe's. And surprisingly, this looks like a kitchen we just put in our house. I wish we'd had this because we made some mistakes. But what it's doing is allowing the HoloLens to be the input sensor, watching the eyeballs of the customer, and seeing what part of that image they're looking at, how much time they're spending looking at that element of the image, and then monitoring body cues as to what they thought about it. And it produces stuff like this. They look at the backsplash, the cabinets, the countertop. Uh, but they have an amount of time they spend on that part of the image tells how interesting it was. And we can detect sentiment from how they behave at the time they're looking at it. Now, there are lots of other applications of HoloLens. I haven't had the opportunity to play with one. But you can imagine the number of possibilities when you take that as a sensor input and build it into market planning stuff. What should we sell that client? What trends are? occurring in people's preferences, I just about went off the stage, uh, preferences for color, texture, style. Um, this is an incredibly complicated world. I cannot even begin to tell you how much time we spent. I could have built my kitchen in the time my wife and I spent slogging around to look at new cabinets and look at new countertops. I just wanted to buy one. I just wanted to you know, get out the credit card and say, that's fine. My wife wanted to go for six months. It took us six months to do that. I could have built the kitchen. This cuts the time, but during all those shopping trips, think about the amount of intelligence that if you could collect it from me and my wife and 100,000 other shoppers, how much information that would provide to Lowe's. Well, they're attempting to gather here, and you see them beginning to marry that attention data into their market planning applications. 
So this is kind of what's going on. What I'd like you to do, we're getting kind of close to the time here. Um, I want to open, f well, I'm not going to have a lot of time for questions. I'll stay after. There's a lot of places to go get information. Right now, we're kind of divided up along product lines because the R products are merging to with Cortana, but kind of slowly. We're accelerating that pace. So you will find that where we would send you to get training or information about the R products are a little different than where we'd send you for Cortana. Over time, that'll become less of a seam. So there are products you can go look at. There's an MSD and product page on the R products. Uh, there's a lot of training. Um, you might even find me up there. Uh, I take some of that training. There are very rich courses on the edX open learning platform if you want to go learn about data science. And then there's a lot of stuff you can just go spin up on, uh, on Azure, like the Data Science VM. The Data Science VM has all the tools I showed you, the SQL Server database, the R products, all in a VM that's already built. Fire it up under your MSDN subscription, and I'll bet you'll have a tough time running over your 150 a month. So it's essentially available for free. If Cortana is more your cup of tea, and we think in, as we add more of the cognitive stuff, this is where most of the interest goes. Um, you can see the latest by reading our blogs. We have intel Cortana intelligence workshops that we run around the country. We have edX courses on Cortana and a lot of activity right now. If you're in a partner company, we'd love to talk with you about learning more about Cortana and helping more of your customers uh, take a look at Cortana for their uses. Besides all the, that, which is targeted to the users of Cortana and R, these types of applications will be coming into your windscreen as IT professionals if they're not already there. And it sounds like a lot of you are already dealing with it. The app developer in the back, you're dealing with it. Folks that are running the database and having R users come on the database and they want to use R inside the database. That's a new kind of workload you need to grapple with. Well, we have a vast array of career planning, educational materials for core IT as well. And those have some of the support you need to understand how data science is going to impact you. And so with that, I'm going to stop talking. And the cool thing is, nailed it. 431. Doesn't get any better than that. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yes. It does. Yes. Yes. So uh, to repeat his question, he was asking, um, Spark is available on HD Insight in the Azure Cloud. And that's true. And uh, Spark is also available other places, but most people use it on Hadoop. The R products will run in Spark as well. And so all of that scale and expansion capability I told you about are available in Spark. The question the gentleman is asking is a very pertinent question. Well, there's, there's machine learning capabilities in Spark already. Well, interestingly enough, there's about 10 algorithms in Spark and about 10 more in our product. All are accessible from a single session at the same time, and they have different characteristics. And so what the strategy is augmentation and uh, co you know, collaboration across them. We're doing work right now so that you can use both of them within a single Spark session. So once you load the data into memory in Spark, you can run a Microsoft RX algorithm and turn right around and run an ML Live algorithm. And you probably will wind up horse racing them because they use different mathematical techniques. And sometimes one's going to be faster and, uh, or more accurate, and the other time the other one's going to be. So the answer is full support of ML Live. Now, the problem with ML Live is access to those algorithms from R. That's being handled largely from open source work called Sparkly R that you'll find coming out of uh, R Studio. Good question. More questions? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's actually an old use of R. Um, we had a lot of customers doing that long before we got acquired. Uh, I can't name their names because they're very fussy about that. But insurance companies and larger capital markets companies, a lot of the adoption was either in building portfolios to offer to clients or in the middle office risk analytics, making sure we don't get into uh, bearings bank-like trading situations, high-risk trading patterns and practices. But yes, there's a lot of that. What you will find, and the reason R is popular there, is all the sharing that goes on. There's a lot of sharing of algorithms that are very specific to quantitative algorithms, and particularly the application of quant, uh, quantitative algorithms to quantitative trading applications. Yeah, so there's a lot there. A lot, there's a lot of people beginning to use Cortana as well because the trading business in particular is one where the cycle time 
identify a problem, find some data, bring it together, tinker, 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 try, 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 ooh, here's a model that fixes it. In particularly the transaction business and the short-term trading business, those are the kinds of organizations that want to shorten that cycle down to a day if they can. It's really tough to do. It's a lot of, a lot of engineering work. But that is exactly one of the places where the graphical tools can provide a great benefit because they're so fast to cycle in, very agile. More questions? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Good question. I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, a lot of this is kind of due to Microsoft, too. Um, and we're learning it as well. Microsoft has a very large data science team that goes out and does consulting work with clients. You will find that that is the toughest question. And the question that he's asking is, when we start to build these teams, what's the best way to govern and organize? It's highly dependent on vertical market. I mean, how you do it in this gentleman's question about financial services is completely different from how you would do it in a hospital setting. However, we find that there's a kind of a 50-50 split in the way people organize. Historically, the data science guys have tended to be organized under the line of business. But a lot of CIOs recognizing the arrival of the big data problem have said, and, and the emergence of predictive analytics as, as a broad-based function of the business, have pulled it back into IT. So there is an opportunity there to also do a center of excellence style of organization rather than a service providing bureau within IT. I can't give you a lot of coaching there. That's something you probably need to go to those people in your industry and the analysts that serve your industry and, and, and look for coaching on how to organize because it, it has a lot of nuance to it. And it may actually be as nuanced, um, the nuances may be driven more by how you're currently organized even than how your industry organizes. So that's a very good question, but it's a little beyond my pay grade. Thank you. Yeah, sure, more questions. Yeah, one in the back. Just unplug me there if you like. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me be a little more clear about that. The Cortana Intelligence Suite is available as a single packaging of products under a single usage counter, essentially, in Azure. Now, there are sub-counters under it. But you basically access it by setting up an Azure subscription. It runs only in the cloud. Um, at this point, uh, but that's how you access it. So the fastest way to get access to Cortana is to set up an MSDN account. With an MSDN account, you get 150 bucks a month free time in Azure. And so that's the path for most who began using uh, Cortana. Now, the reality is that if you start doing any really heavy work, you're going to probably want to get out of an MSDN account and go see your local partner or Microsoft sales exec to pick a plan that works for you. And there's some flavors and variances there that I'm not that detailed in. But it is cloud only, starts as a credit card, MSDN, and gets you going. But, yeah, I refer to these data science. I'm sorry, what? I refer to these data science. Yeah, so our customers generally follow that other path. But as a, as a strategic partner, it'll depend on your relationship. More questions? I think we'll take them down here uh, and let these guys get going, so I'll stick around for a little bit.